Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Oladipo Agbo Liwaj's play Iale, the first wife. So this is a prequel play to The Estate, um, Agbo Liwaj's earlier play. And this play kind of deals with the fall of um, Chief Adiyema's first wife, Hoyan, and, at the end at least, the rise of Helen, who is uh, his second wife, the wife in the estate. We do get some foreshadowing of this throughout the play. Um, Helen is uh, Toyin's house girl, um, female servant, basically. Um, but like in the estate, the servants have these ambitions to become wealthy, to marry well, to advance their station, whatever it is. Um, and so we get these couple of instances of foreshadowing of what's to come. Um, Helen, for instance, tells Pakima, who is her sort of fiancé, the sort of on-again, off-again fiancé. Uh, Pakima's got all these schemes to get money, and they tend to involve him getting conned and losing his cash. Um, when he... Looks like he's going to have a lot of money. Helen is interested in uh, marrying him. When he loses his money, she is not. Um, so she's talking to Pakima, and at one point here she says, um, I won't be woman of my own house like this, you hear me? So those of us who know the estate see immediately the sort of irony of this. Um, because we know that by the time of the estate, she will actually be the woman of this house specifically, Chief Adiyema's house. Um, we also get this statement a little bit further along. Um, he says, Me I no fit do second wife for any man. That is like harlot, and not so. So quarrel with the first wife. She go come put juju for my head. No. Oh. So, um, Afola uh, Afolabi, who's another one of the, the servants, he's a gardener, um, is trying to convince her to marry somebody, um, become a second wife, basically. Um, and Helen says, no, I won't, I won't become someone's second wife. That's, that's a socially disrespectful or a, a socially denigrating position. And, um, would open me to to the bad will of the first wife. Now, that's striking because Helen does actually become the second wife of Chief Adiyema, not in the sense, not in the the sense of um, a second wife in Islam, where you you're allowed men are allowed to marry up to four wives, depending on which uh, sect of Islam you're in. Um, but in the sense of a subsequent wife. And in fact, things don't work out well for Helen in the estate. And so we get that sense here. Like, again, it, it's definitely a play that doesn't require that you know the estate, but if you know the estate, there's, there's a lot of things that you will identify as foreshadowing and even, even paralleling what happens in the estate. So that's, I think, a really clever approach. Um, that being said, Iale is really interested in a lot of different elements of um, Nigerian culture, politics, um, philosophy, etc., etc. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of them, because there's a lot going on here, and different characters have their own interests. So, one element is feminism, the role of women in Nigerian society. This is set in 1989, uh, but the play premieres in 2009, so, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a 
temporal difference from when it's set. Um, the one element is feminism. Uh, so Mrs. Okonmile, who is the wife of a new minister, um, the military has just taken over the government in Nigeria at this point uh, in the play. Um, though there was also military dictatorships in Nigeria itself uh, in the 80s. But uh, Mrs. Okonmile is a the wife of a minister... I think for petroleum mining and export, which is important because that's where a lot of Chief Adeyema's money is tied up. Um, but she was also a former student of Toyin. Um, Toyin had been um, the, uh, I guess, principal of this girls' school back in the day. Um, and and. Mrs. Okonmile says, I don't know if you remember me, Ma. I was your student. What a great principal you were. I wept the day you retired. Those sermons you gave during morning assembly inspired me to make something of myself. You taught us that it wasn't a man's world. We girls could make something of our lives. And so that, I mean, that overtly introduces the theme of feminism. But at the same time, we have... I mean, we have this sort of this question of, of feminism throughout because Mrs. Okonmila, or sorry, uh, because Toyin is incredibly classist, like in the way that like white feminism in the U.S., the U.K., Western Europe, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, has tended historically to focus on the concerns of middle and upper class white women and have not been as, and has not been as interested in issues of poverty um in issues of um race ethnicity religion etc etc Koyan is very much focused on social class issues Whereas some of the other characters are more interested in a kind of intersectional uh, liberatory movement. But this is 1989, so intersectionalism is not really a prominent way of looking at the world at this time. Um, but this classicism becomes really overt for the end of the play, um, when basically Toyin shames Mrs. Okonmile, um claiming that, that Mrs. Okomile has slept with her husband. And she basically makes this public accusation of, of, of this. Um, and so Mrs. Okomile says, in, in sort of... Um, in this sort of, of moment of maybe personal liberation from the shadow of, of Toyin, she says, I remember my first day at school, how you humiliated me in front of morning assembly, all because I didn't wear the correct shoes. My parents worked day and night just to sew my uniform. They could not afford the sandals. You held me up as a shining example of Owan Omo, uh, which means uh, the children of, in uh, Yoruba, uh, free education, and how we are going to destroy the school with our alatika, which means common behavior. I was not surprised you retired after the last set of your true grammarians passed out. You couldn't stand the sight of us. Now we are in power and you still hold us in contempt. And then a little bit later, uh, Toyin goes to strike her and Mrs. Okomile says, We're no more in school. If you slap me, I will slap you back. I will so disgrace you in your life, you will never forget it. So there is this... There's these elements of classism, um, and it's an interesting thing because Toyin seems to be very much in this sort of headspace of traditional aristocracy, right? Um, she she believes that she's better than the military leaders who've taken over the government. They're 
generally working class or poor wives, um, the people who are now running the country. She believes she is better than them because she is part of this traditional chieftain structure, this traditional aristocratic structure. And what um, what Ariema continually needs to remind her of um, is that being an aristocrat doesn't pay the bills. So this is the other big element here, is the these questions of economic neocolonialism and corruption in the Nigerian government, which is a major, major problem traditionally for uh, Nigeria. So uh, Mrs. Okomile brings this up. Um, Chief Adiema brings this up multiple times. Um, I mean, one of the times he he brings this up is actually in the context of governmental instability, which I think is a, a really important component of what uh, Agbo Yuaj does in this play. Um, so he there, uh, he and Toyin are having a blowout um, because he's a serial adulterer, and she is not thrilled with that, understandably. Um, but she also, he is trying to keep them financially afloat by going to these ministers and basically trying to get contracts under the new government. Um, and she she says to him, you used to be a man of honor. Um and so what he says is, you tell me, in fact, what does honor buy? Does it pay for your clothes? Does it maintain this house? Does it pay for the food? And he grabs her arm and she says, let go of me. Um, and then he says, or does it stop your son being transferred to another school on account of a small altercation? What does it pay for, Torian? You act like a queen, but I'm the one who has to mind the business when the government launches a scheme today and closes it tomorrow. I have to spend forever coming and going from one office to another to get my money back. Then they bring out a similar scheme, only it goes by a different name. I sign a contract in the morning with a minister. In the afternoon, his replacement tears it up. Tell me if I can afford to be honorable so that I do not offend you. Tell me when I, when I can have support in my own house for being pulled here and there by boys half my age. So th there's the personal grievance here. Um, there's that element of like, oh, I'm, I'm forced to continually run around and get these contracts, which are never stable or trustworthy, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a larger issue here of the problem of financial instability in 1980s and 90s Nigeria, um, because of continual political changes and because of corruption in the government, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, very difficult to to build a business and to sort of have stable have a stable economy because things constantly changed, um, and and so this is a, a big problem. The other element of this, uh, the other element that we get in in the play in terms of um the financial situation of nigeria is uh reverend uh archbishop billy robertson uh billy robertson is the head of seems like kind of a televangelist type deal um a sort of mega church um and he's really kind of an advocate for the gospel of wealth, in a way. It's not quite the gospel of wealth necessarily, but it is that sort of televangelist sense that if I do God's work, then I should have a bunch of money, I should have fancy clothes, I should, etc., etc. Um, and Soji, who's um, Adiyama and Toyin's youngest son, who's kind of a... a student radical, uh, he confronts Robertson about this, and he, he, he asks, 
um, about God. So why does he choose to reward you so richly when the majority of your flock are suffering? You're not blind to the tragedies that pass you on the street. You know better than the soldiers who keep us in bondage with their guns. You do it with false promises. You're nothing but a brother Jiro. Um, and so this is the accusation. What so Robertson initially um, points out that Soji has never been poor. Robertson has. And so he has no moral authority to judge. But perhaps the more compelling case that Robertson makes um, is when he says, and how did your father make his money? Was it not on the back of import license? Even candles he brought in. Anyone who made products locally, he made sure he ruined that person. My father grew rice, but your kind treated it like it was poison. You ate only Uncle Ben's. This house, I bet you not one thing is made in this country, and you want to prove to me. Um, so this is, again, this is the, the thing that's actually really striking here is, on the one hand, Robertson is quite right. On the other hand, Soji is quite right. Um, Robertson does use his position as a um, as a religious leader, as someone promising spiritual salvation, in order to enrich himself. But at the same time, a good portion of the reason why so many Nigerians live in poverty is because the upper classes, those with access to wealth and power, disproportionately hoard it for themselves to the detriment of everyone else in the society. And while Soji does seem somewhat aware of this contradiction, it doesn't it doesn't seem to fully register for him how much his life and lifestyle results from the economic inequality that he so opposes. 